although I'm titling this Spaces, Places and Urban Topologies, I might well have called it Re-Engineering the City. So I'm really interested in the way that we can review, revise and rethink the way that the cities function. And uh, I'll show you how I'd like to do this, but it's got much to do with the mapping project which I've been working on for five years. This is where I'd like to start though. The freedom to make and remake our cities and ourselves is the most precious yet the most neglected of our human rights. So the right to the city has been a dominant theme in recent historiographies and so I'd like to <coughs> explore this to think about liberating academia but also uh, local people and politicians from some of the strictures that exist and some of the constraints which influence policies. I used to use a different quotation from Harvey but I think it's still, although it's a long time ago, I think it's really helpful, to me at least. The geographical landscape which fixed and immobile capital comprises is both a crowning glory of past capital development and a prison which inhibits the further growth of accumulation. So our cities are traps. They trap capital. They trap the future trajectory of that city. They're good things because we've saved enough to make investments, but they have limitations and they have restrictions on where we can go. So you have built-in obsolescence as a result of that capital trap. It creates problems for urban regeneration. And of course, because they're old cities and they're trapped in their capital structures and in their lovely historical buildings, they're fantastic for heritage and tourism, which of course is a major growth industry for cities all over Europe and beyond. <clears throat> so I want to really explore some of the emotional and psychological dimensions of urban history and its spatial dimension. I want to remind us that to demolish a building is to lose an old familiar friend and a reference point. Kevin Lynch has said much about that in the distant past. It might be an ugly sight that you remember, some building, some structure which has little beauty associated to it, but it has familiarity. And that familiarity generates a degree of emotional rapport with us as citizens. So the topology of the city is a tricky slippery, messy, muddy thing. And I think the difficulties that we have, and perhaps the reason for so many conferences, <laughs> is that we still struggle with these things. So I attempt the inevitable definition of this urban topology, which I think is inherently blemished. I want to look at topology in the form of topography, how it reflects history, the constituent parts and the spatial relations which are part of a sort of continuous uh, area of human interventions. <clears throat> now, with some misgivings, I'm going to embark on what I do with students here. Uh, so, I hope it doesn't sound too patronising. I've called the character of the city, the DNA of the city, the genetic composition, the instructions used in the growth, functioning, development, reproduction of the city. How do the components fit together? How do we know our cities? How they do so impinges on the way that we interact with cities and how we know the place because that helps to define its character. So the components are really important to this process. The DNA of the city is unique, but it has common denominators. And here, in a way, I come back to what Rule was saying yesterday. Urban identity and place attachment. We generate our attachment to place based on a complex mix of factors. And each place has these factors 
So city A, B, and C have all the same factors. They just don't have them in the same mix. And what they do have is a variation in the mix. So the red here represents where the same factors are present, but where the weighting is different. So here's city A, here's city B, here's city C. <clears throat> C is different in every regard, all factors are weighted differently. So it doesn't matter which element we're looking at, they're common to the cities. I don't care too much at this point whether we, we were talking about linear or Boolean relationships here. I'm not concerned about that. But I am concerned that each of our cities can be compared on some kind of schedule which has a comparative basis in terms of its functional, in terms of functional analysis. <clears throat> now, I, I tried to, to say this in other places, and it, this, this works for some people. So I try this again, the same notion, with a different analogy. So each factor, each different element in the urban milieu can be considered as the angle of incidence in terms of a light ray, a ray of light. That factor, whether it's X, Y, or Z, doesn't matter. But when it hits the city, when it's encompassed in a particular city, the city deflects it in some way. It takes that factor and it amends it in some way particular and, and, and specific to that city. How it does that and what the angle is depends on the city. The city is therefore an active agent in this process. I've also gone into print and using a baker's oven in the same analogy with a different mix. Constructing a career on analogies hasn't really been very fertile. So if we look at the outline of Dutch towns over a long period of time, you can see the profile of these towns begins to change. Of course it does. And this atlas of Dutch urban landscape, which is a, a wonderful visual interpretation of the footprints of cities and how they have changed, and because we have such a long run of historical information for the Low Countries, then we have a really clear idea about the mutation of cities over time and the factors that have influenced it. Now, what factors influence this um, <coughs> are, are complex. And so, uh, Christoph has embarrassed me, so I'm going to embarrass him now. Christoph wrote a really, really interesting uh, chapter in a book which looks at the municipal regulation of parts of Berlin, the Mietzgesehne, the large urban blocks. And in that, he makes the argument that in the last quarter of the 19th century, uh, it's about the connection to, to water and sewage supplies, the town council wanted to change the areas within the jurisdiction, they wanted to change the way in which uh, that was delivered and the water supply company uh, was about introducing toilets and, and, and so forth in these blocks. And of course, landlords then raise rents because there's been an improvement. And as Christoph showed the actual impact, laudable though it was by the municipal council, I think, was to displace people because they couldn't afford the rent so they moved out and he sees and shows the way in which squatter colonies in Brandenburg develop as a result of that institutional decision to try and improve public health. And the same can be said, <coughs> excuse me, in Linköping in Sweden and many other places, where on the east side here, the Ladusgerdbacke, which is an area of settlement and of factory development in the late 19th century, this area sought 
to join the rest of this town and its water system, its network of pipes and water supply. City Council said no. First of all, we have a contract with a water supplier. It doesn't include this area. And secondly, this would be ultra vires. This would be beyond our legal responsibility to do that as councillors. We cannot do it. So despite the growth of a, a significant colony, as it were, on the, the right-hand side, there's a real problem in terms of how regulatory structures impacted on the health and well-being of the inhabitants. Here's another one. There are lots of these in America. I love them. Here you see the state line. It's imaginatively called for Americans State Line Drive. Might have been first, second, or 30 something street, but it's State Line Drive. Kansas City, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri. You can find this all over the US. Why do I pick it out? Because the state sales tax is different on either side of the line. So of course people go for a drink on one side and come back on the other. Human behavior fundamentally influenced by an administrative decision. And a lot of other things go on as well, about policing both sides and so on and so forth. So to just encapsulate this, we have some regulatory arrangements there which have begun to change behavioral patterns as a result of the way municipal authorities saw their responsibilities. I find the construction of this, which Richard Dennis presents in this book on citizen modernity, really helpful. What he says is this, the point of overlaying examples, case studies, from different cities is to accumulate broadly similar responses to the ambiguities of modernity irrespective of local variation. Local variation is really interesting because it shines a light on processes. But we need to generalize from that to make sense of the city. As social scientists, we would expect to have common denominators in the process of urban development. So the common experience of modernity overrides the detail of individual cases. And this is a, a view which I really like. Uh, it's from another Dutchman, uh, Harry Hansen. And he says, I quote directly from him, urban history is concerned directly and generically with cities themselves and not with the historical events and tendencies that are purely incidental to them. Actually, this is a, a crib, a copy, a bit of plagiarism from my predecessor, Jim Dias, because he quite rightly says that we need to distinguish between people, urban historians, from those who are interested in the city and those who are merely passing through their territory. Because we have lots of studies of something in a place, something else in a place, but not of a place. <clears throat> so the urban is a dynamic in this process, not simply a passenger in it. So if I've seen one thesis on education in Pittsburgh or residential segregation in Chicago, I've seen dozens of these. But they're all about the particularity of place. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I don't think we should pretend that they are engaged with the urban variable, if you want to be imaginative about that. So I think we need to do three things as urban historians and I hope as urban studies scholars. I think we need to be able to explain the genesis of cities anyway. I think we need to capture the social phenomenon around that. And I like to think that we could show this in time and place and space. So I'm going to try and attempt some of this uh, clearly and perfectly, well, clearly and imperfectly, by looking at agglomeration, what I call the tyranny of the border, which is about annexations, and by remaking cities, which I take through from the kind of mapping activities that Christoph uh, mentioned a little while ago.
but first about agglomeration. The distinction between intra and extramuros has always been a fascination for people who've looked at cities from medieval to the early modern period. So towns are assigned privileges by kings and overlords and uh, this controls guilds and traders, uh, professionals and artisans and so forth. And by way of example, and since we are where we are, I refer to this work from long, long ago on town foundations east of the Elbe. So you see here every 10 years that there are 25, 50, 75, 100 new foundations east of the Elbe. New towns are founded with carefree abandon east of the Elbe in the 12th, 13th, 14th and into the 15th century. Then we have various crises, some are agricultural, some are here are, are about uh, epidemic disease, and foundations virtually stop. So I think a, a conclusion here that we might reasonably draw is that the population uh, pressure to become part of a viable and, uh, and vigorous township is no longer appealing, or there aren't populations who are able to do that, or that they are tied to perhaps low productivity areas, modest agricultural activities, feudal and tied agricultural labor uh, in certain parts of the uh, world. Now this isn't some neat trajectory where agricultural change in population growth defines urban development. That would be much too easy and simplistic. And there's this wonderful work, which uh, you may know, but this guy, Olaf Meyers, has done an amazing, absolutely, totally amazing thing. This is just one of his towns, new pieces, and he's looked to others in Brunswick. And these are, <laughs> each of these strips is geo-referenced and drawn from um, uh, tithe maps, from, from, the run, from really detailed archival material. And so he shows, rightly, that the central area and the three-field system and the meadows and so forth does expand. So there's capacity for expansion in the rural sector after the Black Death and after these different agricultural crises, harvest failures that affected uh, certain parts of Europe in particular. So what I want to take out of this is that the specialization in productive process adds value. Adding value is surplus, and surplus is about investment. Savings equals investment, it's just straightforward Keynesian kind of thing. So the accumulation of whatever the surplus is, whether it's from trade or agriculture, is part of the process of urban development. And proximity reduces friction. So the transactions costs, as we put it nowadays, encourages co-location. It helps if spinners and weavers together are not absolutely essential, but it's useful. Different metal metallurgical processes benefit from being close to source initially. It's very heavy to cart a lot of this stuff, so it's very important to be able to minimize the labor costs that are part of early industrial production. So specialization uh, creates surplus, proximity reduces friction, and if you can combine this with a sort of, I call it a, a dominant a centripetal core, stealing this from Ed Soja, you get market efficiency to combine in these ways to produce a, a circum set of circumstances through which geographical concentration and social concentrations uh, take place. This is a cribbed view of what Harvey argues uh, in, in his work. I think as a postscript, I might say that at this stage I'd like to feed into the idea that urbanization has always had a class phenomenon. 
whether we're looking at the feudal system and servile labour or manufacturing and servile labour. So, agglomeration, the gravitational pull of the urban. There's, a, there's a, an intrinsic benefit in having concentrations of labour, which is a scarce resource, a skilled resource as well, that leads to the organic division of labour and can produce concentrations of population as well. But let's look at this in a different guise. Here I have a notional manual worker. You see the blue line is wages and the other line is rents. You have fixed outgoings and variable incomings. It's tough being a manual worker in a pre-industrial or industrial age because there are periods of often extended uh, un or underemployment. The wages don't meet the bills. So we find that there are strategies which are necessary to compensate for that. There are long periods here where you might be forced into the arms of the moneylender or other sharp or to charity or wherever you can get a survival strategy. For the skilled worker, the pattern isn't much different. The troughs are shallower. The peaks might actually be less pronounced. There's a degree, not much, but a greater degree of predictability. When we look at this across the board, in the bottom right, you see another line, the clerical worker, the salaried worker, the even distribution of an average wage, perhaps even a salary, a modest, modest salary. This manual, this skilled worker may well have an ability to pay uh, a, lo a lower rent, may be able to manage a lower rent and still not fall into a deficit because of the predictability. So the strategies can be mostly are fundamentally different. And they take the form, as I'm sure most of you know, of a bid rent curve in which distance from your work usually, not just from shopping, but from your work, corresponds or is traded with uh, distance from your home. Because you need to check in every half day to get a little bit of work or something, something to keep uh, your or sales street sales to keep going. So what we have here is a set of relationships, as Frisbee says. There are polarities in the system where the calculability of the clerical worker and the person who's on the steady wage is contrasted with the fortuitousness, the uncertainty of risk-taking of the manual worker. So we introduce a number of dynamics here into the system in which the components have different operating strategies and the composition of the relative elements of manual, skilled and clerical will help define our cities. So if you're a capital city, there'll be a lot more of those clerical jobs. If you're in a manufacturing sector, perhaps a heavy manufacturing sector, it's very different. If you're in, I'll take just two examples, if you take um, the city I used to live in, Leicester, where 50% of the workforce, <coughs> um, <coughs> excuse me, in, uh, down to about 1950, was women, and about 50%, therefore men. So you have women in one sector, textile sector, knitwear, hosiery, and so on, and men in footwear. Two cycles, two industries, not necessarily in sync, two budgets coming in, two wages coming in, a city known for its independent politics, for its secularism, not for established religion, and for a very open approach to civic and civil society. Contrast that with a steel bashing town in South Wales. Six percent of the women are in the workforce. It's a very male-oriented workforce. It's defined by rugby and male boy squires and other things. So the compositional aspects of this are really crucial to understand because of the social 
characteristics which are intrinsically part of that. So I want to go back to the income side. Here's my stress test. It doesn't matter where I start, but let's say I'm out of work. It's likely to affect my health. My health is likely to drive me further into poverty, or it's going to make me even less likely to get work. If I'm less likely to get work, I'm obviously driven into poverty. I'll be back to poor health again. It's a vicious triangle. And the proof of this, for me, is in a study, in, in several studies actually, but this one is of Glasgow school children. This is actually the girls. 72,000 of these girls and uh, children in 1905. Britain is paranoid about Germany at this point, so it's really concerned about the ability to defend the nation, both economically and militarily. This is part of midwife services, about uh, school milk and school meals, about sport and physical activity and well-being. So they do this survey. So what you see here is that in every case, the more rooms that you live in as your family, the better off your health and poverty and income is going to be, such that the four-roomed children, if I can call them that, girls, are 10 centimetres taller from four-room houses, flats, and seven kilos heavier than those that come from uh, one-room houses. Now, I perfectly understand that's not just an instant there. It's congenital. There's an inherited characteristic as well. So there's also a future penalty. It's not just that this is the product of the past. This is the implication of the future. So it's not surprising that Glaswegians die still at 55 men of this class. Die at 55. They have a 25-year penalty over men who live in Edinburgh, I smugly say. But may not be right. So, the compositional aspects here are really crucial. Now, what about borders? And continuing uh, this Scottish theme a little bit. I want to argue annexations and border changes are crucial, that they change our understanding of where a place is. I choose here to look at Edinburgh. You see in 1817, the purple is the built-up area, the red is the land owned by a charity. This charity has huge power. Even though it disposes of some of these plots, quite quickly by, by 1817. It's been in business for about 150 years. When we look at that land ownership pattern, you see the ownership of 175, but you see the dotted line is of 195. So still into the 20th century, the institutional rigidities that exist through land ownership are still present because of the continuities that are associated with ownership of land. That's what the book's about. So I'd say no more about that at this stage, but uh, it's, it's really uh, fundamental, I think, to understanding many, many cities, not all, but many cities, and they're not just uh, British cities either. You see these kinds of corporations in North America, you can see the same kinds of structures in Australia. There are other examples that you will know too. So we have here a set of relations, two sets of relations, through the wealth creation and the surpluses, the migrations to the city to participate in what a city has to offer, which is actually a buoyant labor market by and large. That process produces a degree of uh, centri centripetal pressure, migration to the city. But because of that very pressure, the land prices rise and there is pressure to move out. This is like 
two tectonic plates, or two sort of structures which are in contest. You might see them as grinding mills or something of that kind. This is what's happening as a dynamic in the city. So externally, what I call the smash and grab of land, externally, annexation is an essential <coughs> strategy for the city to grab bits of territory, to add to the land mass, to deal with the housing and the, and the political pressures associated, and also to deal with the tax base. Never forget tax. So externally, that's what I see is, is going on as part of the annexation process. But internally, there's friction. Because as the city gr grows, of course, it is more complex and it has therefore more jurisdictional elements and these elements are contesting space they are contesting political fiscal and other spaces to do what they are meant to do and most important and again i come back to what rule was saying yesterday there's resistance from the, those areas that are threatened that are about to be absorbed into the city so in Sheffield, in the 20th century, there are 72 boundary changes between 1920 and 1975 in the Sheffield boundary. That means there are 72 boundary changes outside the city as well. So whatever the knock-on effects are, they're really considerable in terms of, well, the stationary. How do you collect the tax? What registers have you got? What, what administrative processes have to be changed? What do you have to do to make your area, your new area, function in terms of its management and administration? So pinching bits of land seem like a good solution to the major metropolitan area, but it has really serious implications beyond that. So now I give you a little practical example here. Um, here's the old town. This is the castle here. The new part of the town here. Classical Edinburgh, growing in the early 19th century. There are shards of the city over here. This is part of Edinburgh, even though it's detached. This is the same too. This becomes officially detached in 1833. That's the port of Leith that decides to go solo. More of that later. But look at the accretions that exist over time here as the city expands. Where is the city is an important question. And what is the city? So let me just have a bit of fun here. I said Leith was a separate boundary. So I want to look at where the square is here, the white square. And if you take a look at it now, you'll see that uh, I want to look at two points here and here along Albert Street, just to give you a flavour of place. So here's the first one, Pellerick Street to the corner. This is the boundary between Edinburgh and Leith. Actually, it goes through that well-known local institution called the Boundary Bar, a pub. You can go into the Boundary Bar in Edinburgh and go out to the back. That's fine, you can do that. And you can come in to Leith in the back door as well. That's really important because the licensing laws are different on that side to that side. So here, they officially close earlier by an hour than their strategy. You're not allowed to go out the front door and in. That would be it. But you are allowed to go out the back door. So that's crazy. Now, how do you deal with this? This is the two-dimensional tenement that I've just shown you here on the right. How do you deal with this as an administrator? You can make your lunch in Leith and have a pee in Edinburgh. <coughs> you can sleep in one town and go to work from another. This is crazy. And just to be sure, this is how they drew the line. Just, uh, this existed, this is drawn actually in 1920 when Leith was reabsorbed. The tyranny of the boundary then, the 
the nature, the rather pragmatic, let's give it a, a little credence, pragmatic nature of that is, is, is crucial. So the tyranny of the boundary is what I want to say. Because the data is collected for administrative purposes. It's done for bureaucrats. It's not done for people. So the system is at one stage loaded against occupants. You clearly see it's inconsistent over time and it imposes an administrative straitjacket in the way that the city functions. So it's not just about what is the city, but where is the city. So now I want to think a little bit more about that and think about is it possible that we could actually deal with cities without boundaries? Now, I'll guarantee that none of us here, myself included, can put on a map where the boundaries that affect our life exist. If you think you can, you're mistaken. Because you cannot define where your water authority is. You probably don't know where the data zones are nowadays. You almost certainly can't put the fire district on the map. And I'm sure that you don't know many of the other districts which occupy our daily lives. So we have a multiplicity of jurisdictions which adversely in some cases affect us, but almost certainly conflict in strategic terms with one another. Look at it this way. Let's suppose one of these districts, let's, let's simplify it. They're squares. We have 20 squares here. That's one jurisdiction. We'll call it sewage. I nearly made a stupid joke there. And here's another jurisdiction. Uh, we have 15 hexagons here. We put them on top. And that's what you get. 97 partitions for 35 districts. And although this could be a board game, <coughs> there aren't many that are actually the same. There are a few that sort of match each other, so you could pair them up. I can see a child's puzzle here coming on. <coughs> but my point is that in doing this sort of uh, analysis of different uh, jurisdictional uh, areas, We get into the complexity of regulated space and escalating bureaucracies. <coughs> and also, we're in a situation about institutional rigidities because for every one of those activities I've indicated, they need their offices, they need their civic offices. So you've got a lot of uh, capital invested in, in admin. So the borders, internal and external, are really very, very restricting. So what about thinking without borders? And mapping allows us to do that because we can be quite promiscuous about what we choose and where we choose to, to put it. So to come back to another question which we talked about yesterday, does distance matter? My answer is you bet. So, um, we can perhaps look at different kinds of uh, um, ways of getting data. So here we're in Rome, um, and I thought it would be interesting to see if we could find a restaurant. So there they are, in this particular square. Obviously it's a pizza shop, and another pizza shop. So here we have open street map for a contemporary city. I'm sure many of you have used this in Berlin as well, but other places too. I'll say something about its strengths and weaknesses in a minute. Now we're looking for a Chinese restaurant, there are two. <coughs> 
okay, you get the point. There aren't any French restaurants. There are Chinese ones. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll skip on a bit here. Parks, yeah, we like parks. In other words, we can choose our set of interests. It might be that you're interested in transport engineering <coughs> or parks or some, some other characteristic. And we can select these in any city that's got a decent uh, background uh, spatial infrastructure. And this helps us uh, make a lot of distance. These are the bridges in Rome. And this doesn't have to be, it is a contemporary map, but it doesn't have to be. We can use a contemporary map for its geo-referencing and for its spatial specificity, for its accuracy, <coughs> and reposition our existing historical knowledge. So here we have markets from 1477 to 1825. So textual reference, no street numbers, but a textual reference which we can geolocate and then produce the map. Don't really have street numbers, as you probably know, in uh, European capitals. Paris, probably the first in, in the 1780s, but uh, very few before 1800. Here's another um, little routine. This is about Jewish businesses. I was interested to know whether the pogroms in Europe affected uh, Edinburgh, and here I map the businesses which were attributed to uh, Jewish families in 1894, and see their spatial distribution. What do I learn from this? Well, it's a start to make an analysis. I've got some information, which I could never have got any other way. So I see there's a certain sort of cluster. Is it around the synagogue? Perhaps. Is it affecting, is it affected by other considerations locally? Yes. Is it different between 1894 and 1939? Yes, a little bit. Still, it's quite clustered. And similarly, here, I want you to notice that there is a huge concentration of solicitors in 1861. Beyond, here's the castle in this area here, not the new town, but in this part of the new town. And if we look at it later, they've migrated. They've left this part and come to here. Within 50 years, I didn't trouble myself to think whether it was in the 70s or the 1900s. So I've got an idea that's going on that the solicitors themselves might not have known about. That's something to, to analyze. And so on and so on. Here, I look at compensation for slave payments and the way in which capital is then reinvested in local railways. I can look at medical occupations. Here are the doctors <coughs> on the cluster on the left. The message here is, don't get ill. There are no doctors there. But there are pharmacists. So a completely different business practice, a different spatial relation, because the relationship between the pharmacist and the individual is completely different. Did we know that? Yes, I suppose so. Can we measure it? Yes, we can get senses of concentration, the radius that exists between businesses, we can measure that. What about other key areas? I like to take butchers because they're critical to local economies, to localized neighborhood economies. So here they are in 1851, 61, 1911, 2017, none. So I don't need, I don't need the city council or any other authority to deliver this material. I can obtain this from other sources. I'm independent of the structures of power and numerical and quantitative authority. I can, I, we can do that. Here's another example, police boxes. So if ever you're in Edinburgh, Look out for the police box, because nowadays, that's where you get your next coffee shop coffee from. 
So these were points of political of, of labor control, of control of the labor by the, the police force not to report in. But if we draw triangles, something statisticians call the Voronoi distribution, then we can measure the density. I've given it color, but we can get statistical sense of the concentration of things. It might be Jewish businesses, here it's police boxes. And from that, I just took this a little further and just thought I'd amuse you really, that this is about where policemen lived. Now it used to be the notion that you couldn't employ a policeman in the area that they worked in because they were likely to be on the take. They might not prosecute uh, uh, regulations very vigorously. So there's not a great deal of evidence from that, but you can't tell that from this. But when we look at the addresses, we find certain relationships. Now, coppers are slang for policemen in English. So I have cohabiting coppers here. 44% of the workforce of policemen lived together in 1881. Brilliant. They don't tell you that, but when you look at the birthplaces, it's not surprising. Because one in six come from the northernmost county in Scotland. It's nearer to Norway than to almost to Edinburgh and certainly to London. Two-thirds of all policemen, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of policemen here, two-thirds come from northern counties. We need an explanation. So I have an explanation, but it's a little consequence. It's about literacy, I think. So um, I'm, my point really is to be removed from this by understanding the spatial distribution of characteristics of urban society, not just urban, but could be society, which leads us to develop hypotheses and to develop ideas about how we should interpret them. We can go further with this, a lot further. I've uh, been taking part with somebody else, looking at money lenders in the interwar period to see how they coalesce and of memberships of different clubs and societies. There are many of these that we've been involved with. In this particular instance, there's a massive uh, political movement against the development of the Royal High School, it's called, which is a, it's an outstanding neoclassical structure uh, by uh, an international developer. And so what I did there, this is, this is what they want to change this into this, with these two wings on either side. So what I got was the letter of objections. So there are 1,700 of these in the first wave. And to look at the sort of notion of nimbyism, to what extent is it the people who are most affected, who are most active? And so by looking at that, this is where that site is, here. So there is a concentration, definitely. But there are a lot of people in other areas as well. And that's just the ones in Edinburgh. There's about 15% outside, many of them all over the world. But when you link that, to an index of multiple deprivation, then there's a slight change because the blue-ish are the wealthier districts. So although there is a significant lot who protest against this development here, many of them come from reasonably middle class, fairly well off the households as defined by the Scottish Index of Multiple Deprivation. But having got the letters of objection, we can then look at them in terms of the relative sentiment. So this is sentiment analysis, doing contextual work to understand fear and anger and joy and attitudes towards things. So the spatial element has driven the agenda to look at something else. It's not that I couldn't think about that myself, but I've got somewhere to turn 
to begin to explore and expose it. Just to characterize it, nothing surprising. Women are generally less angry and more joyful than men. That's a conclusion you would see from here. And there are objectors who don't add up. There's 500 of them who, who don't admit to uh, gender uh, at all. So they are pretty much the same as everybody else. In this. So the experiential the, uh, is worth, uh, I think, looking at. i just play you this. Unfortunately, you have to do with my voice. Don't think I can project this here. Some regular posts on the Lost Edinburgh Facebook page. They're obtained from both public and private sources and are often surprising and always informative. Cityscapes and street scenes, tenements and trams, posters, events and leisure activities are the main subjects of these posts. Lost Edinburgh informs and reminds us of what was and what is the basis of the present and future Edinburgh. More than 120,000 followers like Lost Edinburgh page, the equivalent of one in every four of Edinburgh's population. MESH, mapping Edinburgh's social history, has added significant value to 4,000 images by developing a searchable and enriched database of lost Edinburgh. Descriptors such as subject matter, street, activity, and date, together with captions and descriptions historical information have been inserted and the copyright and provenance of images obtained whenever possible. In addition, coordinates and orientation have been identified and a detailed and accurate map on a par with the Ordnance Service muster map is used because OpenStreetMap has the advantage of open access. With all these refinements, we now have a searchable database for the lost Edinburgh collection of images, which can be queried on a thematic, temporal, temporal or spatial basis, and is superimposed on OpenStreetMap to make publicly available online. By plotting the locations of Facebook, change for different James area, River Black, Sydney, Street scenes, of course, convey physical aspects of the city. The characteristics of place as most parts of the watch houses, houses, black frames, prefabs. And this is possible also in conjunction with the rare city. This rebalances memories available of the comments and pictures by attaching significance to all this outside. So my point here really is that we tend to have images of elite buildings and this is a way of capturing things which actually interest people and who have sent in many pictures and of course like other sites uh, manage uh, them um, in, in very different ways. So I'm going to skip this and just um, move to to this. <coughs> I've been looking at rentals. Rentals I see as an encapsulation of affordability. It's a way of compressing a lot of information about household economies and how they function. Um, this is a study of 34,000, in other words, the complete residential sector in Edinburgh in 1861. It allows me to look at rentals according to occupation of the occupier, property ownership, trusts and institutions, gender balance and so on and so forth. And it's extraordinary and I'm really pleased with the way it's going. I've not uh, done anything with it uh, here. Uh, 
rather faded light, so I have but just uh, the married women on the left and the unmarried women on the right as property owners. So looking at uh, that is a, an unusual and, and uh, interesting characteristic. Here I look at the relative variation, so the coefficient of variation, the relationship between average rent and standard deviation of rent by street. In other words, how much social variation is there, how much rental variation is there along the street. So you see here, with houses of £80 or £60, that actually the variation, relatively speaking, is very similar to streets which have got rentals averaging five, six, ten pounds. So relative poverty, relative wealth, may be just as variable in some of the wealthier streets as in the poorer streets. This is a way of getting, uh, this is a means of getting away from some of the difficulties which we, we have in, in conventional approaches to uh, the city. And so, this is very much about using open street map, open data, making data available, using tools which are available uh, freely, not yet, but wait a couple of months. Maps which are more accurate, more up to date, and which are the basis of historical mapping. So when we use our maps, our open street maps. This is exactly the same data mapped by Google, by our national standard, Ordnance Survey, and by OpenStreetMap. This, because we put <coughs> the address where the door is, doesn't seem to ask too much. Here at Ordnance Survey, put it in the centroid of the building. That's a problem for historians because many buildings get amalgamated, so you lose the contextual nature of the address. Whereas with OpenStreetMap, we have much greater precision. We don't have things in the middle of the road where we all know about Google, but equally, you see here, the Ordnance Survey, our official mapping isn't actually as accurate as OpenStreetMap is. Now that's really important to me as a historian to know that when I have an address I know where it is it's not speculative I could say a lot more about this about the nature of licensing copyright restrictions etc etc but I won't at this stage at least but I just say that the amount of work that's necessary is huge this is just a, a sheet of uh, annotations uh, which are the basis of a city-wide survey of 100,000 uh, properties. Each of the plots is a polygon and georeferenced. So if, in its wisdom, the government should ever reform the tax system, they should start here. Because it's so accurate and has its plots, it's a three-dimensional, an accurate three-dimensional record of the city. We haven't quite got the colouring yet, but I can tell you that where you see a tree, there is a tree. Because there are some people who are really keen on mapping trees. Great. So this is the basis of our historical mapping. And it has an accuracy and a legitimacy which I think is difficult to challenge. It deals with the shortcomings of other systems in the way I suggest here. It deals with scales. There are corrections for offsets. This may not matter to you, but if you're a geographer, you'll know all about offsets in historical maps, so we can correct for those by using the underpinning here and then correcting the historical map to that. National Library of Scotland's 160,000 georeference sheets. You'll find many of them are not for Britain. So last year I was at a meeting in Darmstadt and I suggested that if they wanted to see what happened in September 1944 and what their city was like beforehand, they'd do well to check out British maps beforehand. So there's clarity in licensing and consistency and for those of you who know about uh, OpenStreetMap, I think it's a really important way ahead to understand 
the social relationships of the city, whether they're historical or contemporary. And with that, I think I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you.